looks at you at the back looking for a seat. There's still a couple of free places uh, around the middle here if you want to try to uh, sneak, uh, sneak in in various places. But anyway, I think we'll get started because uh, Mr. Stanishev has a pretty tight schedule today. So, uh, Mr. Stanishev is uh, a former Prime Minister of Bulgaria, now a member of the European Parliament, and the president of the party of European Socialists, which is the second largest uh, grouping in the European Parliament, and has historically fluctuated in power positions with the um, European People's Party, which at the moment has the uh, majority. This, of course, is an interesting time for social democracy in Europe. There are so many challenges to Europe in general. We have, of course, famously Brexit. And with the Brexit debate, I think the interesting thing is, for those of us like me, uh, obviously born in the UK, following the uh, dis discussions, there was no social democratic voice. Um, the uh, Labour Party was absent from the discussion for various internal reasons, but also because the debate seems to have shifted to the right. And we hear radical right populist parties in some countries far more often than we hear the more established, more mainstream social democratic voice. So anyway, this is a time of uh, turbulence, a time of change, and I hope that Mr. Stanishev will be uh, addressing these issues. We'll start with a lecture from Mr. Stanishev, then we'll go over to a question and answer session, and then at 11.30 we switch to a press conference, so at that point the uh, students can go and sample the delights of the uh, cafe uh, downstairs, where no doubt the carbonada has your name written on it. Right? <laughs> okay, so Mr. Stanishev, over to you. Okay. Well, thank you very much, first of all, for the opportunity provided by the faculty and your university to speak in front of you and hopefully to provoke some interest and questions and answers about where Europe stands today, what could be the future of the European Union and every country in it. Uh, you mentioned Brexit, interesting times indeed. And uh, I would remind you that there is a Chinese curse to live in interesting times, which is something very bad in the end because it's always related to turbulences, instability, unclear perspectives and many, many risks. Indeed, I mean, we are living in time uh, when things that sound completely impossible become possible and even happen. Your country joined the European Union 12 years ago. My country joined 10 years ago, and I had the privilege to lead my country in this process as Prime Minister. But I do remember the emotion, the hopes, the expectations which were existing at that time in the, in the new member states. It was really a national motion and a big hope about a better future, about greater stability, social prosperity and individual success as well for the people in our countries. And if someone at that time would tell me, 10 years later, the question will be publicly asked in the media and in the society, would EU survive at all? I would say, you're kidding. That's not possible. EU was on the rise and the prospects looked very positive. Nevertheless, we are seeing that the European Union is uh, under big pressure by one crisis coming after another, overlapping, creating a big sense of instability, insecurity and pessimism. And this is something very dangerous for the European idea because for decades EU was deepening as a process of integration between countries. EU was uh, growing and enlarging for one simple reason. <coughs> because it was creating a positive emotion and the sense of better perspective, better future for the people living in the countries and for the next generation. And today, for the first time in decades, we are facing a reality when actually your generation faces the real perspective that your life will be less secure, 
more difficult, less job opportunities, lower salaries, proportionally at least, than the life of your parents. And of course this creates pessimism. And uh, indeed it is a time of big change, of big transformation. The problem is that transformation is happening without enough political will and without direction. It is happening somehow chaotic and the events are imposed upon us, also upon the political forces and the institutions. And this creates the big risk for the future of the European Union. Briefly, I would say the following. We are living through a crisis of a philosophy, politics and governance practices which started to dominate European political landscape since 1980s. This is the conservative revolution of Margaret Thatcher and in America it was Reagan. And this is the neoliberal philosophy which is the pillar, the basis for all these policies which were followed uh, by the centre-right, which was dominating political life, but also uh, influenced to a strong extent also the centre-left. The essence of this philosophy was very simple. Less state, more deregulation, the market is fair for itself, the market is self-regulating and prosperity will come automatically. But I will remind you a phrase by Max Weber, who is perhaps the, one of the best scholars on capitalism, on classical capitalism, who used to say, markets can be productive, constructive, and a driving force of uh, society only if they are put in an iron cage of regulations. Closing the quote. What happened since then? Exactly the opposite. And uh, it was working for a while because it was creating a lot of uh, economic growth. But the problem is that with all this de deregulation, without taking it into account the needs of the society as a society, not just as an economy, because economy is a tool in the end for the society and for people to live better, to meet their needs. It led to a speculative financial capitalism, which was further and further away from real economy, which created the bubble in America, in Europe, that exploded in 2008 and created the big financial, then economic, then social, in the end, a political crisis, because they're all interrelated. Now, the problem from my point of view comes from the fact that the response of the European Union in particular, both political and economic, was not the right one. Because I do remember that at the early stages of the crisis, there was a broad consensus between socialists, conservatives, liberals, that three things should be done. First, to save the financial system, which was right, because this is the blood system of economy. Second, when the markets are insecure, to provide public investment as a driving force for the economy. What has been done in 1930s in America, in Germany in a different way, during the big crisis. And the third thing, when there is a crisis, this is the time when people need support. When the states, society should give a helping hand to those who lose their jobs, who have lower salaries, who feel insecure. And all these changes changed in front of our eyes in several months. When in 2009, the Conservatives, the European People's Party, which you mentioned, won the European elections with huge majority and won many national elections in key countries in the European Union and created a different policy which is uh, expressed in one word, austerity. So here I come to the three alternatives which Europe is facing today. And each one will have to make your own choice because politics will reach you. Even if you are not interested in politics, politics is interested about you. 
The first is the status quo, which says more or less the following. We had the right recipe to fight the economic crisis. It was austerity. It worked. In Spain, look, they're starting to grow. Their, balance, their budgets are more balanced. But, and many other countries as well, Ireland, Greece, from their point of view, the problem is that this policy goes in complete contradiction with the expectations and the needs of the citizens. And this policy had a price. And the price is that the very fabric of these societies has been destroyed. And the confidence in institutions that they work for the people has been destroyed. And also, because this policy was imposed by the European Union, EU has started to be perceiving, perceived as a negative force, which is punishing countries and people. So where the optimism could come from? Then, of course, people start looking for another alternative. And the second alternative, which is on the rise, are the extreme nationalists and populists. And they say one very simple thing. All the problems which you are facing in Latvia, in France, in Germany, are coming from the European Union. This is the bad, evil machine far away from us, an artificial project of the elites, etc. And we know your concerns about your jobs, about your education, about your health care, about refugees and migration. And there is a salvation. And this salvation is to quit EU, to close our borders, to create fences, walls, to separate, to isolate, and then we'll save you. By the way, this alternative is using, is using very strong, very powerful social uh, populism and uh, social language. It says, I do care about you, Le Pen is saying, the French worker, and I will protect you from the immigrants in the UK, UKIP, and also the Conservatives say, the big problem are the immigrants from Latvia, Bulgaria, Poland, the Polish plumber, etc. And, and this creates really emotion. And people in this insecure time say, yes, maybe this is the anchor which can create me, my family, and my country also a difference. The problem with this alternative, although it looks quite attractive to many people in the short run, is the following. It needs an enemy. It, needs, it plays with fear as an emotion and political instrument. And when you have an enemy and a fear, then you have also anger and hostility towards the different, the other. Be it the refugee, be it the immigrant from Central and Eastern Europe, be it your neighbor, your neighboring country. But we have seen it. We have seen it in Europe in the 20th century. Actually, not only in the 20th century. Through all the history of Europe, it's a, you know, if you read history, it's only from one war to another. And the European Union, as an idea and as development, is a unique experiment, if you wish, to help us, the people of Europe, different nations, to live in peace and in cooperation. This has never happened before in that way. And this is an asset which we shouldn't lose. Because the alternative which is provided is that in the best case scenario, we shall look at each other through fences with hostility and rivalry. In the worst case, we've seen it in the First and the Second World War. I'm not saying that that, that will be repeated the same way. But the trend and the philosophy is the same, and the basis for this policy. And here we come to the third alternative, which exists, and these are the social democrats in Europe and in every nation. Because, uh, and this is our responsibility, because from the very beginning of this crisis, we were the ones who was clearly saying this prescription of austerity only is the wrong one. We need strong investment policy, we need social protection, and we need to change Europe so people could feel that their lives matter to the institutions. 
And in 2014, in the elections, we didn't manage to win them, unfortunately. But unlike the APP, we kept our level of force. And this changed the atmosphere, I would say, in the Commission and also in the European Parliament. And gradually, the trend is moving towards more investment with the Juncker plan, with other activities, more flexibility on uh, the Stability and Growth Pact, which is one of the tools really enforcing the nations for, towards austerity. And also what we say, we need to democratize the European Union to make it closer to the people. But I must say that we haven't done enough. Because apparently Europe needs a bigger change, more radical and deeper change. This is why we started in our political family, especially after Brexit, a very serious and open debate with our prime ministers. We have nine heads of state and government in the European Council, with our group, with our member parties, in order to elaborate a much clearer perspective about a different Europe, a Europe which protects, a Europe which performs internationally and economically, and a Europe which creates really optimism about the future. Because in politics, in there are several basic emotions which create you know, public movements. It could be fear, it could be anger, discontent, and it could be hope. What we are trying to do is to create hope about a better future for Europe through very clear vision about what changes are needed in the European Union to survive. I should probably stop here because I uh, just wanted to give a very short and brief picture because for me what would be the most interesting part hopefully of this uh, conversation would be your questions. They would, I hope that they will provoke me and I hope I will try through my answers to provoke further questions. Because after all, this is what we all need, a conversation about our concerns. And there are so many, many issues uh, which I believe are of concern for you today. You know, of course, I was asked in a TV show in the morning about refugees. And I asked, OK, would you tell me, please, how many refugees do you have in Latvia? So we are so much concerned about this. And I heard a figure about 23 or maybe 100 people. Well, it's a big threat, indeed, for Latvia, for your way of life, uh, for, for whatever. But it's a reality. I mean, we are facing as a union a serious challenge. One and a half million people knocking at our doors last uh, year. Not that we cannot handle it, but people are saying, OK, if it goes 100 million this year, two million next year, three million, and how do we control it? And how do we manage? How do we integrate? So this is a serious question. Of course, there is a big question about Brexit. Uh, and just in a few days, the prime ministers will meet in Bratislava. We as a political family will meet there with our prime ministers to discuss what kind of direction and policy we should have, uh, in which areas we need more Europe, and what kind of Europe, which is even more important question. Of course, there are many other issues which are related to the situation in your country. I'm not an expert on this, but uh, of course, I have prepared myself to a certain extent, especially having uh, as a partner the uh, Saskana party, which is led by the mayor of Riga. I would like to uh, thank uh, Mr. Ushakov for his invitation to me and to our delegations, to the deputy secretary general, of PS uh, Giacomo Filibeck, who is here, part of our delegation, to our specialist on Central and Eastern Europe, Konrad Gowota from Poland. Uh, so we are here, of course, to interact with our political partners. So whatever questions or interesting things you would like to hear from me, you're more than welcomed. I'll try to be as open as possible. Thank you very much indeed for your patience and interest. Okay, well. I wasn't expecting to get more from the end, but the evidence is really so important, so don't change that.
So I'm going to ask the first question while uh, we gather Just our time thoughts. for reflection. Exactly. Yes. And um, so, Mr. Sandishev, you said uh, that you know things could be done differently. So my question to you is, what concretely do you think should have been done differently over the last year or two years uh, in Europe? Essentially, since uh, the European Parliament elections, since Mr. Juncker uh, taking over the uh, Commission uh, presidency and then the string of crises which followed. I mean, not that Mr. Juncker caused them, but uh, you know, they've been dealt with in a certain way by the uh, President of the Commission um, and by the uh, People's Party in the, in the European Parliament. So what would you do differently? Well, uh, first of all, I would say that the European Commission should be much more outspoken and more decisive in the changing of the course of economic and social policy in EU. And as I shared with you, this is happening because the uh, European Fund for Strategic Investment, which is a combination of public money from the European Union, public guarantees from the European Commission and the European Investment Bank, and uh, private money, should be 315 billion euro. But from my point of view, very few projects until that moment has really been started to get implemented. And we don't have the time. We don't have the time because, you know, all these projects, they won't happen overnight. And people have no patience anymore. People are getting angrier and angrier, and they say, we want change now. The second thing, uh, the European Stability and Growth Pact. This is... You may have not heard of this, but this is, you know, a tool created by the EPP because they were dominating, as I mentioned, in the period 2009-2014, which was actually framing the austerity-only policy and actually creating all these social tensions in most of the states. By the way, in Latvia, you also suffered from this very much indeed in 2009, 2010, and later years with the many cuts in social areas. And that's the policy which is mandatory for every government. So we managed to shift it a bit, but not enough. Because again, in politics, figures, mathematics matter. It matters how many prime ministers do you have, how many MEPs, how many members of the European Parliament, because in the end it's all voting. How many in favor, how many against, how many abstain. And that's the way how you achieve results. It could be this way or another way. But I would like to clarify one thing, because very often also national politicians, and prime ministers coming back from the European Council are saying to your citizens, to the citizens in Britain uh, or in Germany, it's the European Union that are forcing us doing this. But the truth is, what is the European Union? The most powerful institution in EU is called European Council. In the European Council, you have 28 men and women who are sitting around the table and take these decisions. So in the end, it's shared responsibility of the member states and the political families uh, in Europe. So, in my view, the major thing is more rapid change. And also another thing uh, should be shown by the European Union. And this goes back again to the Council at the first place. Bigger, you know, decisiveness to show efficiency in handling the many crises which we face. Coming to the refugee crisis. It's not true that Europe does not have a solution. The European Commission at least provided a plan. Then the, the countries, most of the countries started saying, ah, it's not, it doesn't fit us, then it doesn't fit me in this direction, in that element. So the impression which you are having, and most of the Europeans are having, is that it's not working. He is not able to take decisions and to implement them, because there were decisions taken, let's say, about this redistribution of 160,000 refugees across EU. 
And I'm asking the question, is it really a problem for any country to take a couple of hundred, for example, refugees? No, it's not a problem. Even not for big countries. But if there is no common, you know, a feeling of commonness. It's, it's like in a family. EU is a family as well, in a way. A family of nations. If in your family you face a problem of one of your members of the family, and if you leave him or her alone, of course it will be a big problem. But if you get together with a feeling of common destiny, of common future, then there are no problems which are not manageable, that cannot be resolved. Especially in a European Union, which with all our difficulties and differences, is still the richest union economically and socially on earth. On earth. And we should never forget it. And we have our responsibilities. And to finish uh, the answer to this question, I'll tell you, give you one example. The younger generation. You know, wherever you read newspapers, uh, magazines, or watch TV, a political debate, a political article, there is a common you know, understanding. There is a big problem with youth unemployment and with the position of the young people in Europe. Am I right? You have heard of, of this, probably. Yes, and everyone agrees, because the average unemployment with your age is two times higher, doubles the average unemployment in the country, in most of the countries. There are some exceptions. In Greece or in Spain, the unemployment of the people of your year age is 50%. That means each second of you, if you would be Greek, going out from your university would be jobless. <coughs> Which means no start in life, no incomes, no family, which you can afford, and no perspectives in your life. And all political parties across spectrum, Le Pen, Merkel, and of course us, and more left to the wing, Tsipras and the rest are saying, something should be done. Well, we, as a political family, have elaborated and proposed a European youth plan. And now we start a political campaign in all the member countries and pressing on the European institutions with the support of our Prime Ministers, our group, to implement it. And this is a plan of four pillars. One is employment. Because we say, if the market is not providing jobs, then EU should help the member states to create qualification and jobs for young people. And we demand 20 billion euro until 2020. <coughs> And this will be a fight which our Prime Ministers will have in the European Council. Second thing, education. Being students, you have heard of Erasmus+. Plus, and probably many of you have used this program. Have you? Yeah. Because, look, this is the most popular program of the European Union with quite little money, effectively, in comparison to the overall budget. What we want is Erasmus Plus to become for all, to be more affordable to all students and secondary education students in the schools. So you would have these opportunities to go to another university or school and to learn more to become better prepared. The third element of this plan is culture, because Europe is not only economy, it's not just a common market. It's a cultural identity in many ways. What we want every young person in Europe to have personal European culture check provided by national and European financing. So you have a check with a certain amount of money with which you can go to a cinema, to a theater, ballet, or do other cultural enterprises. And you develop as personality. Because life is not only food, but it's also I mean, human, intellectual, emotional development. And this is working already, because in Italy, Matteo Renzi, he initiated this idea, and in Italy it also 
already is implemented. And we want to press all the member states to do that. And the, third thing, the fourth thing is child guarantee. Because it is a shame that in Europe, which is, as I already shared, <coughs> the richest continent, we have children who go to bed hungry. And this is a shame. And when it comes to money, because our opponents, the Conservatives, say, we don't have the money, there is one question, which is hanging in the air with big, big, you know, strength, like a big cloud over the political landscape in Europe since 2009. People are saying, you bailed out the banks with public money. What about us? So for me, the question is again about political will. When you have a clear political priority, there are always ways to find money and to implement it. So my hope is that our political family will be able to have that political will and to, in a dialogical way, to impose it on the others and persuade the others. Because otherwise, I mean, for the first time, I'm really concerned about the future of the European Union. But it's all in our hands, also in yours, as voters and active citizens. And because it's about your future. Okay, and let's open up now. Um, and, and please, uh, the, the one thing is, if you could introduce yourself, just say who you are and what you are. Okay, you go. Who's that Okay, so Marta Sula is a uh, student of the third course of political science. I wanted to find out, you mentioned that the Europe, European Union is a family and we lost one of the members of family like Britain. So what do you think? Do we need to fight to get this member of family back in home or we need to focus on, on our problems more? Thank you. Well, of course, of course. Look, you know, life is funny sometimes because uh, the truth about Brexit is that no one wanted it. Even those who campaigned strongly for Brexit. Because it all started in a very political way and in a, in a very low way. In a, because David Cameron had a problem. He had a problem within his own party because the Conservative Party is severely split in the middle, Europhobes and Europhiles. Europhiles. Before the elections, he decided that in order to consolidate his party, to provide the support for him as prime minister and as a leader, he should give something to the Europhobes, who, those who are against the European Union. And he said, I will negotiate, renegotiate our relations with the EU, and then we'll go to a referendum on this question. And the other task which he had is to limit the expansion of UKIP as a political party. What is the outcome? And then he, in the negotiations, he didn't achieve anything serious. It was, it was just a small bargaining about peripheral issues. And he campaigned in favor of staying. And then he said no, he had no. So he will remain the prime minister who gambled the future of his country for his political purposes, lost the power, and took Britain out of the UK which is a historical event. Do you know, the next day after Brexit, what was the most uh, popular Google search? What is EU? What is EU? People didn't know, and nobody told them the truth. And UKIP, Farage went away. Why? Just to have holidays, as he said. I'm tired, I did my mission. Because his party lost any sense of, you know, why they should exist. They were existing because they say, we want Britain out. Okay, out. They are out, or they, they are supposed to be out on the basis of the citizens' will. And what next? They don't have, you know, a reason to exist. A mission, a political mission. And without a mission, a party is useless. So he's also out of politics. And you know, it, it, is become, 
it has become uh, Johnson, Boris Johnson. A brilliant, I mean, uh, speaker, very emotional in his campaign. Why did he do it? Because he wanted to replace David Cameron as prime minister. He said, I'll play against him, so half of the party is mine, and then I become even more, you know, visible, and I'll be the next prime minister. And he won. People said, Brexit. What next? His party saw the polls. Uh, oh. Half of the country hates him, more or less. That means that these people who voted to stay in, 48%, will never vote for Conservative Party if he is leading the party. So they tell him, oh, take the foreign secretary office, but don't think about becoming prime minister because we shall lose elections. And they really don't know what to do. They don't know what to do. There hasn't been a plan. What happens to Britain in UK relations with Europe if they leave? Because they were all saying, those who you know, champion the exit from the EU, we shall keep the good things in EU, we shall just not let the immigrants come in, and we shall keep the money for us, which we are paying for the poorer East Europeans. And then you said, dear friends, we respect our British you know, European colleagues a lot. But in order to have access to the common market, as you wish, including the financial markets, which are vital for the city, you have to respect the four fundamental principles and freedoms of the European Union, which is also movement of capital, but free movement of people and common market of the labor force, which can have no restrictions. So now they sit and think, and my impression is that the whole strategy of the British government is to wait and see what will happen. Would the mind of the people change or not? And then a miracle solution may come out from the sky. Well, it will not. If you don't have a strategy, someone else will be imposing his or her strategy on you. The European Union, you know, in the European Union there were mixed feelings after this event. More or less everyone was shocked because it was not expected. Everyone was thinking that after all, I mean, Brits are reasonable, pragmatic people. They wouldn't do such a gamble with their destiny of their own country. Because it's not only about being in the EU, but there are many, many other questions which arise. For example, what happens in Northern Ireland? Because the Good Friday Agreement, which was signed under Tony Blair in the late 90s, was to a great extent achieved after decades of a, not civil war, but big turbulences and terrorism, because both countries were in the European Union. And this helped a lot. So now what happens now? Nobody knows. And mainly those who are responsible to know. What happens to Scotland? Because Scotland voted unanimous, not unanimously, but with a huge majority to stay in. And there is pending issue of the Scottish referendum because they say, oh, we want, you want out, we want in. So we want out of EU to be out of Britain to be in the European Union. So it's a big issue. I don't think that the European Union should make efforts, as you say, to you not know, to bring them back. We cannot back. If you don't want, it's your decision. It's your sovereign decision. We respect it. Let's make this divorce in the most civilized way. But don't expect, please, that you will be specially treated because Britain was specially treated for many decades. They, had, they were paying proportionally much less than Germany or other countries as fee for the membership in the European Union. So their contribution was less than it should be economically. So if they expect special treatment and all the benefits in the Union without being members, I think that the mood is very clear. No way. <coughs> and some Many people actually even were saying, OK, he was, uh, UK was always blocking any effort for further integration. 
And this is the moment when we can really use the fact that they're out and finally do something more. And again, indeed, there is a big debate. More Europe, less Europe. Sometimes it's completely distorted by you know, politics and politicking. But in reality, there are areas where we really need more Europe. Look at the, again, refugee and migration crisis. Can any country solve it on its own or deal with it on its own? Uh, we, we are seeing that even Germany, which is the biggest country, the most populous, the strongest economy, has problems doing alone with that. Or Sweden, which is the second destination for most refugees, with how many? Eight million population, I think. How can they handle half a million, let's say, refugees coming in a couple of years? Well, it's really changing the whole balance of the society and the welfare state and many other things. Or if, by any means, half a million refugees fleeing from a war somewhere or instability somewhere knock at the door of Latvia, can you? No, you can't. You're complaining about 23 refugees. And this is a big debate, yeah? So, on this issue, we need more Europe. Because every country on its own will be drowned in this sea of insecurity in the global world. The other area, terrorism. Thanks God, your country, for the time being my country, we are not direct targets. But who knows? At a certain stage, if the terrorists decide for one or another reason to strike here or there, Nobody can be safe. So, on cooperation against terrorism, of course we need bigger cooperation because in Paris, as you saw, there were hundreds of people killed in terrorist attacks there. It was not refugees, it was not foreigners, it was citizens of the European Union. So, the services within the European Union definitely need to cooperate more on this or on external policy. I know it's very sensitive, and I know that every country has its tradition, dignity, interests, etc. But in the end, if we don't work collectively with common will on crises like Syria, for example, trying to find a political solution there, then we shall have more refugees knocking at our door. And if every country in Syria or in Libya or somewhere else pulls in different directions, nothing will happen because the different vectors of the efforts will eliminate each other. So Brexit is a problem. It's a psychological, political problem for EU because for the first time a country wants to leave and is leaving, on the way to leave, perhaps. Nobody's sure, by the way. Completely. No one is sure that it will really happen. Because after negotiations, which will happen one way or another, probably next year they will start, the outcome, who knows what it will be economically, then British people may say, ah, we didn't th think that this is the outcome. You didn't tell us. So let's vote again. Who knows? I cannot bet on anything. But... Uh, and the other thing is that, uh, indeed, uh, we need to learn to exp and to have the political will, again, to export stability. To export stability, which means to work for peace around the European Union. To work for economic stability and prosperity in the countries like North Africa, Middle East, so people have jobs there. You need to invest. And again, our opponents will say, but we don't have the money. Well, if you don't have the money for this, you'll need to find money for refugees. Simple as that. It's a matter of political choice. So it's, uh, in the end, all in our hands. Because life changes directions every day and every minute. And each choice which we make is influencing this general trend. Okay, Mr. Stanisha, I'm going to follow up on something you said about the uncertainty of Brexit. 
and I'm going to ask you to make a forecast. Will Britain actually leave the European Union? <laughs> yes or no? <laughs> I told you I wouldn't bet. You know, I wouldn't bet. Logically, they should, they should leave, and this is the trend. But uh, many people, also in the British media, they're saying, okay, we did a referendum which was not really, you know, informative. People didn't know what they're voting for. You were promising one thing and another outcome came. And then we have to see what will be the outcome of the negotiations and then finally decide. So it's very tricky indeed. I wouldn't bet on anything, but the logic is that they leave. Well, okay. It's, it's life. It's life. I mean, people get together, people go apart. But I cannot give a prediction. That would be, you know, if I would have a prediction, that would be a million dollars answer. I would be a very rich person because I could play on the markets with that. Not that I've ever done it, I'm not an expert, but I hear that on political predictions, if you're right, you can make a lot of money on the market, at the market. And you can also lose a lot of money. Yeah, you can, but I, if I would have the answer, look, all my personal problems would be solved for life. Okay. And maybe the problems of my kids as well. We have a couple of questions. I'll, I'll tell you what, we have uh, uh, three questions. So why don't I collect the questions? Yes. Uh, actually, we have four. Uh, He's always linked to class as well. <laughs> Put his hand off. Okay, five questions. And this guy was even, used to be even later, but okay. Right, let's start with uh, Mr. Uh, Miller. Um, my name is Richard Miller. I am a student of political science here. Um, first of all, I would like to thank you for your speech. Um, it's very hard to disagree on uh, many, if not most, issues with you because you have raised many valid points here about the future of Europe. But my question is this. What would happen and what would you do if your policies fail, even if there are enough conditions for successful implementation? How different would you be, let's say, from the others who are failing Europe right now? Okay, and then the second question is over here. Yeah, I'm a third year student of international relations here. And you talked about pol exporting political stability abroad, and I thought it was very interesting, especially regarding refugee crisis. Turkey is a very pivotal player here, and uh, European leaders have been very hesitant to comment on the post-coup uh, situation in Turkey, which seems to be moving away from European values. Do you see this as a bargaining chip in, in the European relations with Turkey, the refugee deal, and do you think this is the right stance? And do you think that there should be more, you know, export of stability abroad? I mean, if you if you say that Europe is uh, exporting stability abroad, maybe they should have a stronger stance on Turkey. Thanks. And this, by the way, is one of our students who was an Erasmus Plus in Turkey, I think, ah, uh, just returned. So it's working. Hence for interest, yeah. And uh, now I uh, hand over to the dean, Mr. Oswald. Yes, uh, you several times mentioned uh, refugee crisis here, and you also said about Latvia. Yes, we received, we accepted, 20, I think 29, but 22 of them are in Germany now. <laughs> and, um, and my question is the following. It's for, at least for two reasons. One reason, of course, it's our problem, closeness of our <coughs> labor market. But the second reason is that financial support in Germany is 10 times bigger than in Latvia, oh, uh, approximately. I, I, I don't have concrete numbers. And my question is the following. Do you have, I think that on the one hand, we may wait for the future, that its level of social economic development will become not so different. But what to do now? Because people want to go where they have more money, more support, Germany, Sweden, but not Latvia, I presume not Bulgaria, probably, <coughs> yes? I, I don't know, I don't know. Yes, so that's why. What is your proposal? To use somehow European funds or what to do? Because it also may cause uh, problems in countries because our pensioners will say, okay, when they have two times bigger money than, than, than our average pensioners, then it will be a problem also. What, do you have any plan B for this, for this case. Thank you. Good morning. Uh, it's 
second to respond to Kapsan Sudan. You pro uh, previously talked about crisis, changes, and challenges that we are, as Europeans are facing. So, is there actually anything positive going on that we could look at that and say, hey, it feels good to feel, be European? So. <laughs> And then I guess the last question uh, over here. Yeah. No, 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 I just suggested to give an opportunity to ask another question. Oh. I have lots of privileges to ask questions later. All right. <laughs> <laughs> All right, okay, so we have uh, questions. You have uh, eight minutes, so two minutes yeah. of question. <laughs> question. Yesterday we met with the mayor of Riga. Uh, with, with Nils and I asked him many questions so today there will be a return session because of course I come here to Latvia because our political family has 33 members, member parties uh, and uh, I want to know about every country what is the concrete situation, what are the challenges of our party and uh, I must say that uh, I feel, I said it today in another TV, which was uh, the, the Russian speaking TV, I was also there, it will be broadcast, uh, that uh, actually for me, I mean, these ideas of uh, the Saskan party are very, very close because one thing is social democracy, because social protection is important for every person creating equal chances, which is crucial for social democracy. And the second idea, to live in harmony, this is a very European idea. Because, again, I w walked around Briga yesterday and I was so impressed to see uh, a Catholic cathedral, a Protestant uh, cathedral, an Anglican church, an Eastern Orthodox uh, uh, church, all together in one city. This is beauty and this is opportunity. But that has nothing to do with the questions. We'll continue to discuss our political matters with Mr. Ushakov later. So, uh, what would I do if my policy fails, well then I would say I'm not for this job, I have to, to leave it. The problem is that, you know, in the European, at the European level, in the European political party, we're not structured like a national parties, that I'm elected and I have a full mandate to do whatever I want for the next four years. We are a party of parties, like an umbrella party, and we work very interactively with the member parties, so it's common responsibility in reality to achieve this. And the second thing is to achieve something, you need to fight and to win confidence. Because again, you need mathematics, you need numbers in votes, you need numbers in uh, seats in order to impose your policy. On the exporting on political stability in Turkey, well, Europe has exported quite a lot politics in the last 10, 15 years. I would not, together with America, and with America leading, sometimes not to the best way. I mean, when I speak about exporting stability, I definitely don't mean war. Because in Iraq, what happened? It just destroyed you know, the whole system in the Middle East, not to mention Iraq as a country. And a similar thing happened in Libya, a similar thing is happening in Syria. It's very complex. So when you don't have a plan, what you do after you depose a dictator, then uh, it's very risky because you, if you create chaos, in chaos very often monsters appear like the Islamic State did. Uh, speaking on stability, well, EU as an idea is a force for peace. We are not NATO. NATO is another organization. We, we are also members of NATO, most of our countries, but not all. But EU is a force of peace. And this is the soft and attractive power of the European Union. So if we manage to help in Syria to stop the war, this will be a great achievement. And I know that Federica Mogherini, who belongs to our family, is doing great efforts in Syria, in Libya, in Iran. Iran, when there was a deal with the government, she contributed so much together with key social democratic and socialist foreign ministers like uh, Steinmeier <coughs> and uh, Ero in France to achieve these agreements that this is the way, plus economic investment and opportunities and cooperation with these countries in order to achieve something better. On Turkey, our relations are very complex. What I have always said publicly, it's on my statements in, during my visits to Turkey, 
in front of our prime ministers and everywhere. We need this agreement with Turkey from pragmatic reasons. But this is only one element of our relations. And it cannot be traded for human rights. And I have never, and my political force, the European Socialists, have never kept silence about this. In, the, in January, I think it was this year, together with Giacomo, we were in Turkey meeting our sister parties, the CHP and the HDP. And also we went specially to Istanbul, from Ankara, to visit the prison where Cem Dundar, the editor-in-chief of uh, Cem Hurriyet, was sitting. They didn't let us in, but we made a protest in front with, other intelle with intellectuals from Turkey. And I wrote him a personal letter, handwriting, under the rain. He then replied to me to show that that matters and to show that not to us, but to the Turkish authorities. I think this is essential and our family will never make a compromise on human rights, democratic rights of people, not in Turkey, not in Hungary, not anywhere. Uh, the Honorable Dean asked me about the Plan B. Look, let's start by implementing Plan A, because there is a plan adopted by the European Council about helping the countries who are really overburdened, like Greece and Italy, in taking 160,000 refugees to different countries. <clears throat> and frankly speaking, I don't really understand all this fuss. Yes, politically, there are political forces which can use it for their purpose and play the scary game with you. Say, ah, you will have 200, not, not 29, as you mentioned. You will have 200 refugees from Syria uh, and Iraq, and it will destroy Latvia. Yeah, it will. <laughs> well, if something like that can destroy Latvia or Bulgaria or any other country, then why do we exist? I mean, we are not serious states. So let's do this plan. And listen, speaking of your country, of course you cannot pay to the refugees who come to you or my country, which is also a poor one in comparison to Germany or Sweden or uh, West European countries. This much more than our people are paying. And this is why I'm saying that the austerity policy is the basis for the lack of confidence in EU in general, because when you don't have a helping hand from your state and you have to meet uh, dozens of thousands of refugees from your budget to pay something, you say, that's wrong. My state doesn't have the money to help me. Why should we help somebody whom we don't know? And that has to be changed. Uh, is anything positive happening in Europe? Plenty of positive things. Plenty. Uh, you know, my first visit to London as prime minister was immediately our, after our membership in EU. And I had a lecture uh, at the London School of Economics, where I have studied before. And there was a community of Bulgarian students who came to me, about 100 people, said, they told, said, thank you for your efforts. Because th from this year, from the 1st of January, we are paying three times less as a student fee than we used to pay until the previous year. And again, the freedom of movement, that you can educate here and go to Germany or to Poland or wherever you wish and find a job there, isn't that nice? The fact that you have many more opportunities than if you would stay just in Latvia in your country without access. I do remember until late 90s, my country, we had, in order to travel to Germany, we had to queue four days. For, not four days, but four days. Uh, sometimes, sometimes two days, sometimes one day, in the queues in front of a German embassy, a French embassy, whatever. Then we felt really second class Europeans. And you did. Now it has changed. And many positive things are happening in culture and in many aspects. But look, it's also up to you. Do you look at the bright side of life? or just the dark side of life. Because life is not only white and black. There are good things and bad things happening every day to each one of you. In the end, it depends on you. How you, what is your attitude? If you only look at the problems, then they will overcome you. 
If you try to look at the good things and look for positive emotions and try to change things for, for better, then it will start happening. I personally believe in that. And I will stop because I can see that we are off the limits by now by one movie story which I like a lot. This is one of my favorite movies. I quote it now and on. A flight over a cuckoo's nest. This is Milos Formans, originally Czech director who went to the United States uh, during communist times, who created wonderful movies like Amadeus and many others. And this movie is about a psychiatric clinic with many people being there, but they're like in prison, you know, and Jack Nicholson is playing the main character who is put there because he is very uh, turbulent, violent, independent person, and they say he's crazy, so he has to be to go there. And there is a nurse who is very negative and always oppressive towards these people, these human beings. And it's like really in concentration camp, the attitude. They're very cruel. And he decides to show them that things can be changed, and at a certain moment he tries to remove one big medical machine, which is really very heavy, maybe one ton. And he says, it can be done, and he starts pushing it and pushing it, and he doesn't, and he sweats, and he doesn't make it. And he says, well, at least I tried. In the end of the movie, another character, a big Indian, when other things are happening to Jack Nicholson and his character, tears out this you know, machine, breaks the window, and escapes towards freedom. So please, when you face injustice or something you don't like, or something you want to change, do try to change it. You may not necessarily succeed the first time, but if it's a good cause, if it's something worth it, it will bring you a lot of personal satisfaction about your life. So make your life interesting and meaningful for yourself, then you will be successful. Thank you. Okay, and with that, we end the uh, lecture and the Q&A part. Um, uh, remember, after we finished applauding, we don't start yet, um, uh, then uh, the students <laughs> exit because then we switch over to the uh, press conference part of today. But in any case, thank you very much to uh, Mr. Sonisha for a fantastic <laughs>